As an NEPM sustaining member, your ongoing monthly contribution from your bank account or credit card help us bring local stories and exciting new programs on every screen and every speaker. I believe together we can create a better future. Simplify your giving. Become an NEPM sustainer today at NEPM.org. You're watching New England Public Media, WGBY Springfield. I think he was a terrific father, sometimes. I think that he was a loving husband, sometimes. I think he was, like so many people, except this enormous talent. Hemingway is very complicated. I hate the myth of Hemingway. It obscures the man, and the man is much more interesting than the myth. Tune in or stream Hemingway this April on NEPM. Coming up, stories we're connecting you with tonight. Is Massachusetts ready for legalized sports betting? 25 states have now done some form of sports betting legalization, including almost all of our neighbors. We visit a bookstore that's as much about community as it is literature. We can build as a community. We can turn a sore spot into something that is like a rose. And we'll examine the post-impeachment political future of Donald Trump. I don't think he's going to be the nominee, but I know that he will have a huge part in shaping who that person might be. Details on those stories and more up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Good evening, and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point. I'm Saidalis Bauer. While casino gambling has been legal now in Massachusetts for some time, legalized sports betting has not. And State Senator Eric Lesser has recently introduced legislation to change that. The Longmeadow Democrat has said that he thinks that the state has taken a cautious approach to sports betting and believes that the legislation, which would allow both in-person and mobile betting, could generate significant revenue for the state. He spoke with me earlier today about his reasons for putting forth the bill. It would create a legal uh, betting market for sports wagering in Massachusetts. It would create uh, two different types of licenses, a, a brick and mortar license. So people would be able to go, for example, to their local casino or their local horse track uh, and place bets. It would also create a mobile licensing program so people could use uh, online betting programs, for example, DraftKings and FanDuel are some of the most well known, uh, but there are a lot of other ones out there as well, and they could be able to place bets on their sports teams uh, through that means as well. You mentioned in your press conference that Massachusetts has taken a fairly cautious approach um, when it comes to this legislature. How so and how does the bill um, reflect this approach? The Supreme Court uh, actually uh, opened the door to legal sports betting about three years ago, almost three years ago. Uh, they invalidated a federal prohibition uh, on sports betting that had been in place for several decades. Uh, what you saw was several states, in particular New Jersey, act very quickly after that Supreme Court decision. At this point, there's about 25 states that have some form uh, of legal wagering. Massachusetts uh, was not one of the first states to, oper to, to move into legalization. And I think that was probably the right move for us because we've been able to learn a lot. Uh, we've been able to see what's worked and what hasn't in New Jersey, for example. And two of our neighboring states, New Hampshire and Rhode Island, also legalized recently and we've been able to see for example some things that have worked well in New Hampshire and Rhode Island and some things that also probably needed some improvement. In Governor Baker's budget that was released last month he estimated that 35 million dollars in revenue can possibly be generated through this bill. In addition to this added benefit in what other ways could this bill impact the Commonwealth? Yeah, well, so first, you know, I think it's it's worth saying that uh, there's a lot of people that just this is fun. You know, this is a recreational activity. Uh, people want to place a bet on the Red Sox or the Patriots. Vast majority of people that are doing this are doing it in a safe way, in a fun way with limits. Uh, but we do have cases, of course, of problem gambling. We do have cases of addiction uh, or people that are maybe getting in over their heads. So we really craft this law to be very careful to have very strict 
protections in place. So for example, you would not be allowed to use a credit card, nobody under 21. There would be self-exclusion limits. There would be reporting requirements so that if somebody is doing something in an addictive way or something feels off, the Gaming Commission would be able to quickly uh, intervene and stop that. I think something also that's very important about this is it's going to close a broad illegal betting market People are placing bets, you know, in, in illegal ways or through off market or, uh, or black market sites. We would close those sites by doing this. We would bring this uh, practice kind of into the daylight and we would be able to collect revenue from it and make sure it's safe. Now, regarding the amount of revenue that legalized sports betting could bring into the state, um, you said, quote, it's not going to be a panacea to the state's budget issues, and it's certainly not going to be something you can balance the state's budget on. So to the opponents of this bill who would argue that the revenue amounts are not worth the possible negative impacts to the state, what would you say to address their concerns? Yeah, so I think that the bill I put together does address the concern. If passed, it would be the strongest consumer protections and athlete protections of any bill of its kind anywhere in the country. And again, to just point out, you know, 25 states have now done some form of sports betting legalization, including almost all of our neighbors. Uh, so we're going to be able, we've been able to learn from, from that and make this very uh, strict. So just for example, I mentioned no credit cards. I mentioned you'd have to be over 21. We're also including strict limits limits around marketing. You would not be able to target children uh, with your marketing or anybody under 21. We also create a new whistleblower protection for athletes. This is something the players associations and the players themselves have come to us and said that they wanted. So this would mean if a player or a coach or a family member wanted to report something uh, or wanted to uh, tip off the gaming commission about activity that they thought was suspicious, they'd be able to do that while being protected. We also set up a hotline for people to call again, players, coaches, staff members, fans, family members, that they can call to get advice, to ask questions about what might be permitted and what might not be permitted. Now, other bills attempting to legalize sports betting have failed to pass in the state Senate before. How confident are you that this bill will pass? Well, you know, confidence doesn't necessarily go all that far in politics, so uh, it's not up to me. Uh, you know, there's 39 other members of the Senate. There's 160 members of the House. So a process is going to be, uh, has already begun, and will continue to move forward of talking to our colleagues and building support. I do think people are, are coming to the realization and coming to the acknowledgement that this is the time to act on sports betting. As we come out of the pandemic and hopefully start to move towards more normalcy, I do think an issue like this sports betting is going to be something that legislators will be able to focus on. So I do think that it's, it's coming uh, and I do think people are acknowledging that now is the time to get started. As we continue to celebrate Black History Month, this week marked the birthday of the legendary civil rights leader W.E.B. Du Bois, a native of our own Great Barrington, Massachusetts. In a digital exclusive, Connecting Point has a look at his life and the impact that he made on his Berkshire community. And in many ways, the fact that he was raised in the North, and in particular in Great Barrington, is why he became the person that he became. And you can find that story and much more content dedicated to celebrating black history and exploring the African-American experience available right now online at nepm.org slash connecting point. In 2004, Z Johnson converted the first floor of a dilapidated former drug house into a comfortable, safe place for people to browse through more than 500 books. Since then, Olive Tree Books and Voices has become a beloved community center in the predominantly African-American neighborhood of Mason Square and is just one of a handful of Black-owned bookstores in Massachusetts. Producer Dave Frazier visited Olive Tree recently and brings us the story. I promise to work hard and do what's right. A book can provide a number of things. It can provide comfort. It can provide growth. Certainly. It can change attitudes. It can create self-awareness. It can allow you to exchange ideas. It's a chance to really have some introspectiveness too. You know, really think about who you are as a person and 
what it is that you want to do uh, with your own life. This was an abandoned building, and you know, I'm not ashamed to say that it was, you know, a building of uh, less desirables. It was a former crack house. I remember distinctively one neighbor uh, watching me and uh, said to me, are you going to, you know, buy that place? Are you going to rent that place? You know, I've seen you over here a couple of times. And I turned to her and said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about it. And she said, praise God, because, you know, we want that sore uh, spot to be out of our neighborhood. I vision this as, oh, when I retire, I'll just sit in the bookstore and I'll wave to customers. And that was 15 years ago. That was not the track <laughs> and trail that I, uh, that I was on. Little behold, uh, when the community and when others found out that there's a bookstore, it started to increase. It's more than just a bookstore, though. It's a community, you know, and it's a family, and I think that's why I tend to want to hang out here because it is like a family. Usually when you walk into a bookstore, uh, there's always like the, the section of black books and, you know, black authors, but here it's the whole store, you know, the joy on the walls, the color, you know, it's, 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 it feels like home and not just uh, somewhere where you, you know, buy a book, but you also hear a story. Because I haven't done everything in life, so I'm like... One of the things that inspires me to, uh, to, to, to want to read and want to know because when I come in here I look around and I see so many people that look like me. I brought, brought my daughter here when she was young so for them kids seeing people who look like them you know it's a, it can be inspiring. I'm a woman who has hurt as immensurable as I have loved a child. I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia so I was able to read books about African Americans and etc. because that was my environment and world. So when I looked at Mae Jemison, when I looked at Debbie Thomas, the skater, when I looked at a number of heroes and etc., I could envision myself. I could say, oh, I could be that because I had a framework. It wasn't just my imagination. I had concrete evidence that these people exist. No justice, no peace, no justice. It woke a lot of folks up in terms of, let me really understand other people other than myself. And then let me understand if I'm part of this problem or if I'm going to be part of the solution. Give her elbow. Okay. <laughs> so that triggered a lot of people to come into the store and to really uh, have good conversations about what should be next steps. Even though Mason Square can be portrayed or viewed as less than desirable, I wanted to be able to say, no, that's not true. We can build as a community. We can turn a sore spot into something that is like a rose. I wanted to be in a place that people could consider it their own. It's been nearly two months since rioters stormed the U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C. in a failed attempt to overturn former President Donald Trump's defeat in the 2020 presidential election. The violence left five people dead and more than 100 injured. While an impeachment trial in the Senate failed to convict Trump for any role in the events on January 6th, on Capitol Hill this week, hearings began to examine the security breakdowns that failed to prevent the siege. To get perspective on how historians will view the attack on the Capitol and the impact that it might have on Donald Trump's political future, Connecting Point's Ray Herschel spoke with Western New England University history professor John Back. It's going to come down to how you see him as a person, how you see him as a movement. For mainstream historians, they're going to see him as someone who posed a fundamental threat to American democracy itself, someone that the founders were worried about, frankly, someone who could subvert democracy for his own ends. Whereas for other people, they will see him as the rightfully elected president. They will never see him, as he would say, as a loser. He is someone from whom a great injustice was done, and there will be people who will take on Trump like a lost cause for years to come. Now, President Trump was impeached twice as we all know, and he was acquitted uh, on both those impeachments. After the second acquittal, 
Uh, Mitch McConnell said that Donald Trump, something to the effect that hasn't gotten away with anything yet. And he emphasized the word yet. He said it twice. Uh, what was McConnell telling us then? That he's trying to have it both ways. That Mitch McConnell, who could have at least tried to reconvene the Senate before the end of the last administration, who, according to his own words after the acquittal, said that Trump was guilty, is trying to say, hello, history. Trump was guilty. Hello, Republicans going forward. Let's get rid of him. But at the same time, not allowing members of his party to be exposed to the wrath of Trump and the wrath of Trump's followers. He's going to try to have it both ways. And in some ways, this won't work. But McConnell has been really good at this for a long time. The, the era that we are living in now, in some respects, is the era of Mitch McConnell and his ability to deal with these kinds of contradictions and hypocrisies and paradoxes explains his power. He's not going away anytime soon either. With President Trump's uh, acquittal uh, the second time, uh, what questions uh, arise now with regard to uh, legal issues facing the former president now that he's out of office? Uh, do his legal problems just begin uh, in another whole realm for him? Sure, but this is something that has defined him for the last half century. His business practices are all about not just skirting the edge of law, but pushing right past it. For things as trivial, although not to those involved, as not paying his contractors and workers to those about uh, assault charges and, and real serious problems with business practices, he has simply always just thrown lawyers at them. Remember that the most important person to understand Donald Trump may be his father, but I think Roy Cohn, this famous bare knuckle uh, brawler of a lawyer back in the 1950s. He is someone who showed Trump, as long as you keep fighting, there's a way to keep moving forward. It's not about law. It's not about public opinion. It's about just fighting and getting dirty. President Trump has indicated, or former President Trump has indicated, that uh, he might seek uh, another term in office in 2024. Uh, is this a, a realistic scenario in your mind? And uh, would you see or do you see a uh, a path for President Trump if he does intend to run again. I absolutely see a path forward for him. The question is whether he really wants this. One of the strange things to think about was that back in 2015 and 16, very few people, including then candidate Trump, thought he would win. His goal really wasn't to win. It was to upend the Republican Party and to make himself a kingmaker. What he saw for himself after 2016 was a close election. He would contest it. He would then be a media titan. He would be the person that Republicans would have to come to Trump Tower. What we're going to see for the next few years, what we've already seen, is that Mar-a-Lago becomes one of the centers of conservative politics going forward. And perhaps the word conservative is wrong. It's Republican politics. Trump is not conservative. He's not liberal. He's his own brand. And uh, some, some viewers, well, they don't remember this personally, but a guy named William McKinley back in 1896 ran a French front porch campaign where people came to listen to him. What we're going to see for the next few years is people coming to Mar-a-Lago, political supplicants, political rivals, media figures, and Republican politics will be centered in Florida in a way that uh, is just going to be strange to see. I don't think he's going to be the nominee, but I know that he will have a huge part in shaping who that person might be, unless McConnell and people like Liz Cheney can get their way. And that seems less and less likely. You know, we got the uh, midterm elections coming up in 2022. Uh, what are the midterms going to tell us in terms of Donald Trump's hold still on the Republican Party? Will the midterms tell us, uh, will it be a referendum on how Joe Biden is doing as president? Uh, what is your anticipation for midterms, which uh, haven't been particularly kind to the incumbent president once uh, he is elected. Yeah, I think the number is something like 19 out of the last 21 midterm elections that the president's party loses votes. This is, seems stacked pretty much against Democrats, not just because of the historical precedent, but because of the redistricting that will take place with the census results. One estimate says that Republicans will safely pick up seven seats just because of redistricting. It's very likely, not guaranteed, that the Republicans take back power. And the question is, who will claim responsibility? 
Will this be McConnell again? Will this be Trump? Will this be both? Or will the two of them collide in such a way that we have a repeat of Georgia? It seems unbelievable, not just the January siege, but the events of the day before, for Republicans to lose two Senate seats to two Democrats, uh, two outsiders, a Jewish candidate and an African-American candidate. That should not have happened. If the Republicans had run a halfway competent campaign, they would have taken one or both of those seats. So there is a chance that McConnell and Trump can cancel each other out. If those two worked together, things might be different. But McConnell clearly wants to turn the page. Trump delivered the taxes, he delivered the judges, but he also delivered chaos. And in the long term, it's bad news for the Republican Party. Every Friday night, Connecting Point explores the people, places, and ideas that matter most to Western New England. But it doesn't stop there. You can find us online anytime for exclusive features and content, including the debut this week of part one of our three-part digital exclusive series, Remote Learning, which examines the challenges and triumphs of both parents and students as they navigate education during COVID. There have been days where I feel like a failure in a lot of ways because I'm not giving my best at work or the way that I know that I can work. And I don't feel like I'm giving my best to the kids. It has not been easy. And be sure to catch part two of our three-part exclusive digital series, Remote Learning, available online next Friday. In 1999, the Beckett Land Trust spearheaded a fundraising campaign to save more than 300 acres in the town from industrial development. They soon discovered that the land, which they had purchased sight unseen, contains an old granite quarry with rusted artifacts that were left behind. Since then, the Land Trust has turned the area into a living museum to the industrial age in this region. In recent years, the task of managing the quarry has been overwhelming. So the state's oldest land trust organization, the Trustees of Reservations, has agreed to take ownership of it. But before that happens, the Beckett Land Trust needs the community support one more time. And producer Dave Frazier brings us the story. This is a winch. It was the workhorse of the quarry. A walk through these woods in Beckett is like stepping back in time. Winches, derricks, cables, and old vehicles are scattered throughout a series of walking trails. But the highlight for most visitors who come here is to experience the old Chester Hudson Quarry active from the 1860s until the 1940s. So for 60 years, it lay dormant, basically untouched by time. Ken Smith is president of the Beckett Land Trust, a nonprofit group who currently owns and manages the 300 plus acre site. The Land Trust purchased the quarry from a private owner, according to Smith, to prevent a construction company from reopening the quarry and using the rock as paving material during the construction of the Big Dig in Boston. They would have opened up a new quarry uh, and had 20 tractor trailer loads of granite coming off the mountain uh, every hour, six days a week for years and years. And it would have had a significant impact on the quality of life for the entire town. Financial contributions from town residents allowed the Beckett Land Trust to acquire the multi-acre plot for public recreation and historic preservation. When it was in operation in the late 1800s and early 1900s, Granite from this quarry was used to build prominent monuments and statues in several states. The material that they were bringing from this particular site was extremely high quality. It was known as Chester Blue. It took a very nice polish. It was very consistent in color. And it was so prized that it was exclusively used for monumental purposes. And I don't think it's any coincidence that this quarry started uh, in the 1860s when there was a very large demand for monumental stone on account of the Civil War. When the quarry was abandoned, much of the equipment and structures were left just as they were, as if the quarrymen had gone for lunch and never returned. Over the years, the Land Trust has developed a detailed map showing both the forest preserve trails and the self-guided historic quarry walk. And it's almost as if we have a story line of the Industrial Revolution. We have equipment that was originally steam powered and then converted to compressed air and we have evidence of early electric motors here. Despite Smith's enthusiasm for people to visit and learn the history of the quarry, he is also cautious, saying quarries are deceptively dangerous. 
The cliffs that people like to jump off of can be unstable. The water is extremely dense and very deep, and there are dangers hidden beneath the surface. Not only is visibility below the surface nearly zero, it is filled with fallen trees, old equipment, cables, boulders, and it's extremely unstable down there. Despite the warnings, the quarry has long been a mecca for extreme diving. Its high cliffs are a haven for youths from surrounding towns and states who post videos on social media, adding to the lure of the quarry. During this past summer, I think exclusively due to COVID and the enormous popularity of people being able to spend time outside, we had over 14,000 visitors. Uh, this is just becoming much too much of a challenge for an all-volunteer board to be able to take care of. Um, and we're delighted to say that the state's oldest and largest land conservation group, uh, Trustees of Reservation, has agreed to take over ownership of the property. Before the trustees can take over the property, they have requested the Beckett Land Trust to start a $200,000 stewardship fund for infrastructure work and additional signage for the trails. David Santomena is the Associate Director of Land Conservation for the trustees. We've been in business for 125 plus years and we've, we've got a, a lot of stewardship obligations across the whole state and we're really trying to be disciplined about what new obligations we take on. As a member of the land trust community, we do want to make sure that all of the land trust protected properties stay protected. It's part of what motivates us here. I mean, I don't think there's any imminent risk to that property at all, um, but wanting to make sure that it's, you know, it's in the ownership of an entity with the, the long-term capacity is important, I think, to the land trust community. So that's certainly part of our motivation here. So the land trust in Beckett is once again looking to the community for support and using social media to help reach their goal. In the meantime, the quarry remains open every day from dawn to dusk, and Smith and the members of the land trust hope people continue to visit, learn about its history, and perhaps most importantly, respect it. That does it for Connecting Point for February 26, 2021. Remember, you can always find the stories that you saw tonight, as well as exclusive features, digital-only content, and more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. And please join us again next Friday night at 6 right here on New England Public Media for more stories of the people, places, and ideas that matter most to Western New England. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Be safe and have a good night. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. I've encountered some of the world's most remarkable animals, but many of these seem set to disappear forever. One million species are now threatened with extinction. It's happening in the Amazon, in Africa, in the Arctic. We have a moment.